For those of you who weren't here before, this is Jeff Hare from the University of Washington. He'll talk to us about interactive data analysis, also known as constructing charts. Yeah. So we'll be talking about constructing charts and graphs, but for the ultimate purpose of getting involved in interactive data analysis. So to give you a sense of what I mean by that, let's just go ahead and jump right into some examples. So here's a you know, basic visualization type you know, that Manish told us about, a scatter plot. In this case, it's an homage to Gapminder's Hans Rosling. For example, what you're seeing here is actually data collected for different countries. Uh, this is for 1980. We have fertility plotted along the x-axis, so number of children per household. And then along the y-axis here, we have life expectancy in years. Um, and then we can see the distribution for different countries you know, across the world. Of course, we might want to like, know more about them, so we might engage in interaction techniques. So for example, here I can identify the point representing Bangladesh, but in addition, I see its trajectory through time. So what are the different points um, you know, this country has occupied with respect to fertility and life expectancy statistics? So this gives me some peek beyond just this 1980 slice that I happen to be looking at currently. But of course, I'd like to be able to move through time as well. So in this case, I can just grab the point and drag it along its timeline. And so doing this, for example, I might go back to 1955, where our keynote speaker might have began, um, and then move forward, um, and then see you know, how have these countries you know, developed in tandem. Um, is there similar patterns? Are there any you know, interesting deviations? Here you notice this you know, rather precipitous drop in the lower right. Um, in this case happens to be uh, Rwanda, where obviously you know, there was a, you know, a genocide, among other issues, um, in that time frame. And so in this way, we're using both visual encodings, but also interaction techniques as ways to gain more understanding into a data set. So here we've done that for some statistical data. Um, let's look at another example. This is combining both networks and cartography. So here's a map of the uh, you know, different direct flight routes in the United States. You know, I would uh, contend that this is not a particularly useful visualization. Uh, perhaps slightly worse than what you'd see you know, in the back of a magazine uh, on an airplane. Um, so how might we clean this up? Well, one approach is to consider the interactive channels as well. So for example, instead I might show you a filtered view and allow you to explore. So in this case, you know, as I mouse around, I select different airports and see the direct connections that they provide. So for example, I live in Seattle, so I can see you know, the direct flights coming out of uh, Seattle-Tacoma here. And as I do this, it's not just the visual encodings, the, you know, the encodings of the states, uh, sizing of airports you know, by their, their traffic, et cetera, but also encodings that enable better interaction. So for example, what is invisible here is what's called a Voronoi tessellation. So this is this, this hidden visualization that tells me you know, what is the nearest point at any time. So I don't have to mouse over these tiny little circles in order to select an airport. I can select the nearest point to my mouse cursor at any given time, and that way accelerating the sort of exploration of the scene. But the examples I think I get most excited about are the ones that really enable analysis, and particularly multivariate analysis. In this case, we're going to look at airplane data again, uh, starting with a statistical summary. So let's just take three variables of interest. The arrival delay, so how late is the plane? Uh, what time did it take off in the local time zone? And then also how far it flew. And by taking histograms, so binning those and counting the number of records in each bin, we can get a sense of the shape and structure of these data sets. What are their distribution? And this is useful as an output technique for making sense of data, but I think it's really important to also look at these charts you know, in their potential as input techniques or input devices. So for example, I might make a selection on this chart above, and I can engage in what's called cross-filtering. So for example, I'm picking a subset of data and then just recounting the data in the charts below. So for example, if I ask questions like, well, what might make a plane be late? I drag out to the right, and you'll notice that these flights have much later departure times. This isn't surprising if you're a frequent flyer, you know, the first flight of the day can usually take off if there's no technical difficulties, but any delay then it accrue to later and later flights in the day. So as you get towards the end of the day, you have like the largest accumulation of, of delayed flights. And similarly, I could drag the other way and ask, well, what might lead to a flight being a bit early? And in this case, you're going to see a lot more movement in that bottom histogram. So perhaps unsurprisingly, flights that fly much further have more opportunity to make up time. And while we started with just simple one-dimensional visualizations, you know, in this case through interaction, we're actually able to engage in exploring multivariate patterns, that is, patterns that exist in multiple dimensions simultaneously. And these are some of the things that we mean by interactive data analysis. So with that, let's go uh, back into the slide deck. Now, I've spent a good proportion of my career actually designing tools to create these types of visualizations. So this includes a D3, which you've heard mentioned before, which was created by my former student, Mike Bostock. And then more recently, a set of tools called Vega and Vega Lite, which are higher level languages for creating visualizations. 
All the examples I just showed you were created in Vega, and our most recent language, Vega Lite, actually allows you to express visualizations using a representation very similar to what Manish just presented, basically by talking about visual encoding channels and then the data variables that back them. And so while this is great in that we have tools that allow us to create interactive visualizations, it's of course insufficient to just have the ability to create a random variety of charts. We want some design discipline and some scientific knowledge as well to guide what would lead us to more effective designs. So the next question I'd like to consider is, you know, what makes a visualization good? Now appropriately I put good in scare quotes because of course this depends on your objectives and what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, but for this conversation, we'll assume we mean the ability to rapidly and accurately understand the information that's presented to you in a graphic form. So to, to begin to bite off at this question, I'd like to conduct a quick experiment here in the room. So I'm going to show you two shapes. Your job is to compare them and decide how much larger the big shape is compared to the small shape. Uh, don't cheat by using a measurement instrument. Just go by kind of your own basic perceptual system. Okay, and don't yell out the answer. I will, I will conduct a poll. So some people get really, uh, you know, uh, excited. Okay, so here's two circles. How much larger is the big circle than the small circle? So just take a moment to make that judgment, and raise your hand if you think the big circle is exactly four times larger. Okay, five times larger. Some hands here. Six times larger. All right, seven. Eight. A bunch of people over here. Okay, nine. Some more. Uh, ten or higher. Okay, so that was a pretty wide range. We had good numbers of responses from everywhere from five to ten or higher. Um, so I'm going to ask you later what's wrong with your eyes, but let's move on to another example. <laughs> now let's compare the length of two bars. So same exercise as before. Make a quick visual judgment how much larger the, the big bar is compared to the short bar. All right, raise your hand if you think the big bar is exactly four times larger. Okay. One of you, uh, five times, six, all right. seven, all right, lots of hands, eight, again, lots of hands, uh, nine, okay, very few hands, ten and higher, and again, very few hands. So in that case, we still had a range of responses anywhere from five to ten, but if you looked around the room, you may have noticed that the distribution or the spread in those responses was much more tightly clustered in this second example. And in case you're, you know, you're dying to know, yes, the answer is seven in both cases. So if I took this and melted it down to perfectly fit the circle, you'd find that indeed it is, the area of the circle is exactly seven times larger. And similarly, this uh, long bar is exactly seven times larger as well. So it's an interesting question. Why, on average, were people much more accurate in the case of the bar than they were in uh, the area? And this has been the study of both uh, psychophysics as well as an applied area of graphical perception, which uh, Manish mentioned briefly in his talk as well. So for example, we conduct experiments like this and we can actually build up rank orderings of the effectiveness of different visual encoding channels. So for example, this is a, a results of an experiment we ran replicating the classic Cleveland and McGill study and also extending it uh, using platforms such as Amazon's Mechanical Turk to canvas a wide variety of internet users. So here, for example, you see position encodings tend to be uh, less error-prone or more accurate than length encodings, uh, which in turn are more accurate than angle or area encodings. And so it's through building up you know, empirical research results such as these that we can go in to make you know, uh, design suggestions uh, that might help influence an improved design. So for example, you saw a version of this chart earlier, uh, ranking visual encodings for the specific task of comparing proportions. Where again, your position tends to be the most accurate, whereas things like comparing individual color hues or shades uh, tends to be highly inaccurate relative to some of the other available channels. So this might be you know, interesting from you know, an academic or design standpoint, but one of the things I'd like to point out is that it can have very significant practical consequences as well. So let me show you some examples of that. Uh, so one comes from my colleague, Mariah Meyer, uh, who's now a professor at the University of Utah. And she's done some amazing work working with domain scientists, particularly biologists, uh, to better visualize data. And so one thing that she ran into with some colleagues was charts that look like this. So these were actually uh, uh, genomicists uh, looking at gene expression levels at a small number of time points. So in this case, each little row is a time series, and the color encodes a value. So this gives you this very dense encoding, but we're using color as a primary encoding channel for quantities. Considering that rank ordering I showed you on the previous slide, we could consider alternative encoding channels, such as position, for this primary quantity of interest. 
And indeed, that's what Mariah and her colleagues did in some of this work, which actually allows very subtle yet scientifically meaningful patterns to be much more obvious. This includes, you know, when does something spike? Is it early or later in the time series? What does that slope look like? Does the spike fall down right away or does it persist? So not only can you make these much more uh, minute observations for a single time series, the use of this shape glyph also allows you to do grouping and comparison more easily as well. And so scientists were actually able to look at this and find meaningful groupings of uh, both samples and species that had been very opaque in their previous graphical representation. And if you're still not convinced, I'd like to share with you one more example, which is probably my favorite of all time. Uh, this comes uh, from Michelle Borkin and colleagues when she was a postdoc at Harvard, and they were studying visualizations of arteries. So for example, for doctors to make diagnostic decisions. Now, the visualization in the bottom left was actually the state-of-the-art design when they started their study. So in this case, you know, an anatomically correct representation of a 3D track of an artery, along with a, a kind of default rainbow color encoding uh, to show a measure of arterial stress or shear. And they explored some various redesigns. One was to move from three dimensions to do two dimensions. In this case, cutting open the 3D model and unrolling it so that you didn't have occlusion. You could see the entire surface of the artery at once. And realizing that perhaps the, the, the 3D you know, anatomic correctness was less important than just the general connectivity. So in the upper right, you can see this more schematic form of how the arteries connect while maintaining sort of a standard 2D orientation. The other design move they made here, of course, was changing the color scheme from the sort of default cycling through all the hues of the rainbow to a more perceptually motivated color scheme, where in this case, you know, the areas particularly highlighted in red are those that would be most worrisome uh, to a doctor making a diagnostic decision. And my favorite part of the study is that they evaluated this with real doctors at Massachusetts General Hospital using realistic diagnostic tasks. Uh, perhaps shockingly, here's the diagnostic accuracies using these various visualizations. So you'll find with the state-of-the-art design, doctors were about 40% accurate. Now, that might be terrifying if you're going in with a potential you know, heart condition. Um, and looking at the, the other moves are quite fascinating. So going from 3D to 2D gave a boost of about 20%. Well, meanwhile, changing the color scheme gave a boost more of a 30% you know, improved accuracy in diagnoses. And beautifully, those were additive effects. So combined together, we go from basically 40% to over 90% diagnostic accuracy by making judicious choices in how the data is being visually encoded. Um, so again, while intellectually interesting, you know, in, in cases such as these, getting an appropriate graphical representation of the data may even be a matter of life and death. Um, so that's why I think you know, a careful consideration of these designs is so important. Now, what we've discussed about so far is really about the design of a, a single image, right? Well, can I have given a data set, can I create a specific chart? Now, oftentimes we're engaged in much more wide-ranging explorations. So a critical part of constructing charts and graphs is actually more of this, how do I do this rapidly in a way that enables interactive exploration and refinement of hypotheses? Or put another way, you know, going beyond individual charts, how might we better support uh, the process of effective data exploration? And to do so, we have another set of considerations that we might want to take into account. So let me start with this one motivating example. Uh, this chart comes from my colleague at the University of Maryland, Catherine Plesson. And this is uh, visualizing, um, actually, data from the juvenile detention system in the state of Maryland. Now, the critical bit to know here is that, A, it's about the juvenile corrections department, and B, the x-axis is age. So already, you might be noticing some irregularities with the data. Now, I have a one-year-old son at home, and so I am very concerned about you know, the violent infants here. <laughs> I also have a 96-year-old grandfather, so I'm also concerned about the marauding centenarians to the right here, which I can, I can verify do, do act childish sometimes, but probably don't belong in this data set. Um, and then, you know, in the middle, I have a data point that I really can't explain at all. And so data quality issues often undermine successful analyses, and visualization can be an important line of defense. Now here, as it turns out, you know, people age 0 or 95 was due to the fact that people didn't know the age of the, of the person being processed, yet a data quality integrity constraint forced them to enter a number, right? And so that's why you're seeing that artifact there. I still can't explain, you know, this 36-year-old individual. Um, so anyway, that's one sort of like that we need to run into. It's like data quality problems are pervasive, and we need to be, you know, um, anticipating them as part of a successful exploration. After about a decade or so of teaching visualization and data science courses, I've also noticed, you know, kind of the standard, um, you know, human predilection uh, to confirmation bias or blinder vision. 
As in, like, students might get interesting data sets, formulate some hypotheses, and then dive right into them without a more systematic consideration of the data, and what are some of the other confounding or latent factors they might run into. So we know even just at first blush that a lot of different pitfalls can arise in the process of data analysis. And so some that we've just touched on now include, you know, overlooking potential data quality issues, Others can be this confirmation bias where we fixate on specific relationships. And really, you know, as many of you are well aware, this is just the tip of the iceberg of a number of um, so-called cognitive biases that may otherwise kind of distort, you know, the successful outcome of an analysis session. So an interesting question is, you know, what can we do about all this? Well, I think it's an ongoing and, and exciting and active research area, and I'll share with you today just a one sort of hopeful, useful uh, baby step in the direction of tools that better nudge us in the direction of successful explorations. Um, and in particular, I'll share with you a, a system built by my students and I uh, called Data Voyager. So let me uh, jump into the demo for that. So here's the Data Voyager system. On the left, we've loaded a data set about cars. And here we see each of the different variables in that data set. And each of them have a data type that we automatically identify. For example, is it nominal or quantitative, et cetera? Um, and we have a set of visual encoding shelves. These are the encoding channels we talked about earlier, that we could take a data variable and map it to a particular encoding channel to construct a chart. And if you're familiar with popular tools such as Tableau, this is a very similar model to authoring charts, you know, as, as, as visual analysis tools uh, such as those. But in this case, we haven't specified anything. So instead of providing just a blank screen, what can we do that might nudge people towards a more successful outcome, including a more systematic consideration of the shape and structure of the different variables in the data set and attendant data quality issues that may arise? So in this case, you can see we have univariate summaries, that is one-dimensional summaries, for each column in our underlying data table. And this includes things like, I can see most of the cars come from the USA, some others from Japan and Europe. Um, this is an old data set, so this is primarily in the 1970s. I can see how many cars are included for each year. And then I can see distributions of quantitative fields, including acceleration, displacement, horsepower, and mileage. And doing this, you know, I hopefully get an overview that might alert me if any of these distributions don't look the way I think they should, I might be alerted to a problem in my underlying data. I also get a better sense of what the data contains that will hopefully inform the types of meaningful and reasonable questions I might ask of this data set. Now, at this point, I might be interested in mileage, you know, or fuel efficiency as a particular variable. So if I want, I can manually construct charts as well. So for example, if I dra drag miles per gallon uh, to the Y encoding shelf, I get a visualization, in this case, you know, a variant of a dot plot called a strip plot that shows me the distribution of all the values. But instead of just showing the individual chart, I can also give recommendations that might be useful things to look at within an analyst search frontier. That is, what are useful things that one might want to look at next, seeded based on what I'm currently observing. So for example, I could look at the histogram, you know, see the overall distribution of mileage scores, or look at summaries such as the, the average mileage. And I can go down, I can see other examples as well. So what are relationships with other variables? So for example, with weight, displacement, and horsepower, I see what looks like largely a quadratic trend, that mileage decreases as these other attributes increase. But I see a much you know, more interesting, perhaps, relationship with acceleration that's not quite so clear. I can get cars that accelerate quickly but also have good mileage. And at this point in time, I can tell you that they are nearly all Volkswagens. <laughs> so as I go down, I might you know, discover other things as well. I can see you know, basically how it depends on cylinder. Increasing the number of cylinders in the engine tends to decrease the mileage, perhaps unsurprisingly. And if I go down to the bottom, I actually you know, see a time series as well, which suggests to me that mileage uh, may be improving over time. And all of these were automatically suggested, you know, one by searching over the space of possible visualizations, given what I'm looking at, but then also ranking them according to uh, perceptual measures like those we saw earlier. So this application actually has a model of these rankings of effectiveness for different perceptual channels and data types, and uses that to choose which charts to show you here. Now, if I mouse over this little icon showing shelves in the, in the upper right here, I can actually see the shelves for the, the encoding specification update. So if I want to know how to build this chart, you know, I can learn from, from these examples. And I can click to pivot and make this my current view. Doing so, I can say, okay, here's the raw data, but perhaps I'd like to look at you know, average mileage over time as a useful summary. So if I want to, I could pivot to that. And then doing so, I get other recommendations that might include subdividing the data by some, some meaningful categorical variables, such as how does this subdivide by cylinders or by origin. 
Now, looking at origin, I see something that's interesting and perhaps concerning, which is it appears American cars have much worse mileage in this time period than cars coming from the USA or Europe. So I might want to you know, pivot to this view uh, to see you know, uh, what's actually causing this. I don't want to leap to conclusions. I want to understand, you know, might the data provide some more insight into this apparent discrepancy? Well, I can see you know, one of the suggested charts here is actually to go from a color encoding of origin to using what's called a small multiples view, so breaking this up into multiple charts, which might be very useful if I have occlusion where some of the lines are drawn on top of each other. But scrolling down to the bottom, I actually find another recommendation that's showing a breakdown by cylinders. And, and notice what we find here. A, certain regions actually have three and five cylinder engines, which might be interesting. But also, I, if I see for four and six cylinder engines, all of the different regions overlap. And the low mileage score from the USA is largely due to the fact that it's the only region in this data set that has eight cylinder cars. So this is a latent factor that might have led me to a wrong conclusion earlier if I hadn't done this and understood what is the appropriate context for making comparisons across these different regions. So relatively simple examples, but ones that hopefully highlight some of these issues of promoting a, a broader and, and more systematic exploration of the underlying data set. So now I'll jump back to the slides. And so in addition to you know, building and deploying the system as open source software, we've run a number of user studies and experiments to see, you know, at least get an initial insight into how it affects people's exploration patterns. Um, so some of the things that we found include that compared to existing tools, you know, such as Tableau, uh, people see over four times more unique combinations of variables and interact with two times more than other tools. So we are seeing like this, you know, people are um, observing more unique combinations within the data set. And we looked at some of the qualitative results as well. People found that this uh, providing recommendations helped accelerate exploration. Um, and they also said they, they liked that it shows fields that you, you can include in order to see a specific graph, that the examples shown actually help teach people how to use the system. So this educational scaffolding was a, a nice uh, thing that we discovered as well. But my favorite quote is, is this one that is a bit more circumspect, which says, these related views are so good it's also spoiling that I start thinking less. I'm not sure if that's really a good thing. And as I'll end, I think the number one tension in the space of creating interaction tools is finding the appropriate balance between automation and while maintaining user control. Um, it's a really interesting tension and one that I think you have to balance well to really get the benefits of scale without losing the benefits of human domain expertise and intuition. And so to wrap up, I'm going to give this you know, overview of interactive data analysis. You know, I've started by focusing on visualization, but of course visualization is just one technology that we could apply in a larger process of data analysis. And that includes tasks such as how do we acquire data, how do we clean it, how do we integrate diverse data sets together, all the way through to modeling and dissemination of results. And while we might imagine an ideal world in which one happily skips from one part of this process to the other, in reality, these exercises look much more like this. They are highly iterative and you know, requiring of human interaction and oversight. You know, as I might discover data qualities that might invalidate my data or lead me to clean it in new ways. Um, and if you're a PhD student, hopefully you don't get all the way to presenting your results to your advisors to make them send you back to the beginning um, of this analysis process. Um, and so this is, while certainly very trenchant in today's age, it is not a new phenomenon. So I'd like to share with you a quote uh, from one of my intellectual heroes, the statistician John Tukey. Um, and you know, this is actually uh, from 50 years ago. He wrote an article with his colleague Martin Wilk on data analysis and statistics, in which he wrote, four major influences act on data analysis today. One, the formal theories of statistics. Two, accelerating developments in computers and display devices. Three, the challenge in many fields of more and larger bodies of data. And four, the emphasis on quantification in a wider variety of disciplines. Um, and I think it's rather prescient that you know, back then they were thinking about these problems in ways that I think um, well capture what we're dealing in today's so-called big data era. Tukey goes on to write, while some of the influences of statistical theory on data analysis have been helpful, others have not. Particular exposure, his word for visualization, the effect of laying open of the data to display the unanticipated is to us a major portion of data analysis. It is not clear how the informality and flexibility appropriate to the exploratory character of exposure can be fitted into any of the structures of formal statistics so far proposed. And so in conclusion, accordingly, both approaches and techniques need to be structured so as to facilitate human involvement and intervention. Some implications for effective analysis are one, it is essential to have convenience of interaction of people and intermediate results. 
And two, at all stages of data analysis, the outputs need to be matched to the capabilities of the people who use it and want it. And I've really taken this quote, I think it was you know, really sort of the mission statement for what I do in my own research lab. Whereas in addition to visualization, we look up and down the stack and have created new tools for data cleaning and integration, for data quality assessment, uh, for assessing the role of, of people within the interactive machine learning processes, where they add value and where they actually cause problems. And so there's a rich space of research that's necessary to really advance the science and the practice of data analysis tools. But one of the things I think is most interesting about it is it also serves as a petri dish, or really a microcosm, if you will, for what I think is one of the central engineering tensions of our era. And that is, as I alluded to earlier, this balance between automation and control. We're already cyborgs. We're using automation in various ways, whether it's automating a choice of visualization or, or data processing facilities. But of course, we want you know, the, the, the analyst or the explorer in the loop driving this process towards socially beneficial goals. And so um, lots of interesting tensions uh, to explore here, and I'll just leave you with a very few uh, closing thoughts on this matter. So one is, it's obviously apparent that there are challenges to successfully automating things. Uh, we can have a lack of critical engagement in domain expertise. Automated methods that we produce may be insufficiently accurate to let out on their own. And poor models let loose in the world can have terrible consequences, whether it's because the model itself is poor or that the data that we've trained it on is inappropriate or insufficiently representative. But of course, as human beings, uh, we have plenty of flaws of our own. Sometimes it's hard for us to communicate what it is we're actually trying to achieve. So tools that mediate that are very valuable. Um, we don't do particularly well when we have to do things repetitively, particularly on the order of millions or billions of elements. So obviously, there's an issue of scale there. And there's also these cognitive biases I alluded to earlier, which taken as whole often stem from the fact that our lack of a global knowledge or global context can lead us to overweight local information and so then make a decision that seems right in the moment but might actually lead uh, to worse outcomes. And so what are some of the ways that we can bias against some of these pitfalls in analytical thinking? And so the general strategies that we've been exploring is finding shared representations and actions for both automated tools and interactive usage. You saw this in the form of Voyager, right, where we have a representation for charts and both a person and an algorithm can collaborate together in terms of trying to drive forward an exploration in a productive way. We've explored this strategy in different guises and many other aspects of the data analysis lifecycle as well. Um, I don't believe that we have a magic answer other than that design and engagement and evaluation are all critical to these processes. And I think you know, given the current big data and machine learning hype, we need a lot more of this across the board if we're going to understand how emergent technologies will actually be deployed in a way um, that has the benefits of creating a world we actually want to live in. Thank you very much.